This episode is brought to you by Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies meet cybersecurity compliance requirements and prepare for CMMC. Their experienced team of engineers and consultants assist organizations of all sizes to implement and manage IT systems that meet the technical requirements in DFARS and CMMC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to 123 CMMC. My name is Dana, and I will be your guest, your, your host today, not your guest. And my guests today, I have two guests. We have Eric and we have Genesis. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hey. Glad you're here. We're going to talk about a very important topic today, which is incident response. Mm, something people don't think about until it's too late. So our first question is going to be, what exactly is an incident response plan and who needs one? Okay, so an incident response plan is basically a plan of action if an incident happens within your company. It's something for anyone who's an employee of a company or someone who's on the incident response team. They can look at the plan and be like, okay, we've done this, now we need to do this and then this. An incident response plan essentially makes sure that an incident is properly handled, um, anyone who's notified needs that, who um, needs to be notified is notified. Anything that needs to be reset or recovered is done so properly. It just um, is just a plan of action if something bad happens within a company. Um, I would say any company nowadays probably needs an incident response plan. Mm -hmm. um, most, if any, I don't think there are any companies now that don't use some technology and all technology could um, have some sort of incident. Even if you aren't a tech-based company, um, an incident response plan could be helpful for cases like a break-in or fire. You should have a plan of what to do, like where you would go after that, or um, how you would recover your data after that. That's a very good. That's a very very good point. Um, you know, what do you do afterwards? But I also like to say to people, this is just like we all knew as kids and today what we would do if we had a fire drill, right? We all had a fire drill. We all knew what we needed mm -hmm. to do. We had to get up from our seat. We knew which door we were going out. We knew that our teacher was going to do a head count. We knew when we could go back in the building. Everybody learned that. And we're not. We didn't see, and nor are we today, seeing schools burning down every single day, right? But what we are seeing every single day are these cyber attacks and most people do not have anything put into place. So it's kind of like if something happened right now, they, everyone's looking at themselves or everyone's up to you know whatever they think is appropriate to do as opposed to what you're saying, have a very specific plan. And what, what we're seeing, what I've seen in the industry is, is honestly incident response is typically, nobody thinks about it until Till they need one, but the reality is, is that incident response, having an, an IRP in place, is, is really a foundational piece of your, of maintaining a solid security posture against attacks. Because uh, attacks aren't a matter of if; it's a matter of when. That's the reality we live in today. Mm -hmm. and that's what everybody needs to realize: it's not <laughs> if it's going to happen, but when is it going to happen to me? All right, so our next question is, so who should you contact if you notice that there's an event or an incident? This is a very, very good thing to talk about because all the employees need to know this answer. <laughs> um, an incident response plan, or at least a proper one, should tell you exactly who to contact in case. It should tell you who's the first person you can contact. It should tell you who's on the incident response team, which is another person you can contact. It should tell you the leader of the incident response team, which would be another person to contact and probably one of the first people for high priority incidents such as like an immediate thing that needs to be resolved um if you don't have an incident response plan in place the best thing you can do is contact either a higher up or anyone on um your cybersecurity team or if you don't have a dedicated cybersecurity team probably someone on your tech team um, but you should, as soon as you notice an event or incident, you should let it be known almost automatically because you don't know how far it could reach or who else it affects. So it's good to reach out to at least a higher up or someone you know who's related to tech because even if they aren't on the team, I'm sure they could easily contact or would have the number for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important too to make sure the employees know that, listen, if you suspect something, you're not going to get in trouble, but we do need to make sure it's getting addressed right away. So if they don't, they don't think, well, maybe I did something on my machine and it'll, maybe it'll just go away or, you know, whatever the case may be, because it's probably not just going to go away. So, um, yeah, that's that's very good. Very good. 
Eric, do you have anything you want to throw in there? I feel like I jumped in and interrupted you. No, no, I, I think it's covered. I think the, the key thing uh, is a part of who you contact uh, in the event of an incident. The first thing that we do on our side is isolate that. And Genesis, she can talk to this a lot more you know, than I can because we've recently done this. But, um, you know, an employee would contact the someone on the incident response team. And then that team jumps into place and isolates, you know, whether that's, you know, malicious, you know, software or whatever that might be, but we isolate the problem and then we go back and look at the impacts, et cetera, which as I said, Genesis can talk to a lot more smartly than I can. Yeah, it's always better to overreact for an event or incident than underreact. So even if it's something simple, like um, an employee who should not have access or weird logs, it can be really important to report those and deal with those, even if they end up being non-malicious or um, only being an event and not an actual incident. Because if it was an um, incident, it's kind of like a fire. The longer you wait, the worse it is mm -hmm. for a lot of incidents. And in cybersecurity, you have, instead of like minutes and hours, you probably have seconds and nanoseconds because of how fast the data can transport transfer mm -hmm. that's a good point to refer to it as a fire because it's that's exactly right the longer you let it burn the more damage it's going to do yeah. i like that analogy it's a good one it's like goes right along with my uh fire drill one <laughs> um all right what was i just going to ask you oh so so let's say should we tell the employees if something does happen should they um shut their computer down and unplug it um that's not always what you should do because um you could have important files on the computer related to the incident and just shutting it off and um, unplugging it might not always isolate it, depending on what it is. For example, if it's a worm that's spreading through your network, you shutting off your computer is not going to help fix that. And it may make it harder for anyone on the incident response team to actually get evidence and the logs to see that. So it's not always the best case. I would contact someone first. Um, if you know what the incident is or have some knowledge of it, maybe take steps to isolate. But other than that, I would not recommend doing anything until you've reached out to those people because by shutting it down, um, you lose all the data that was in that live state, which is what we call when a computer is on. There's a lot of data that is lost when you shut it off. And it can be very vital for investigations of the incident or try to figure out what happened. That's a good point because I think people get nervous and they're like, oh no, oh no, I, I just pretend it didn't, it didn't happen. I'm gonna shut this down. So that's good, good for people to know. I always bring that one up too, so that's good. Okay, so here we go. So what should employees do during an incident or potential incident? Okay, so a regular employee, someone not on the incident response team, as soon as they notice something's up, like their computer's running a little slowly or they're getting weird pop-ups, they should immediately contact someone on the incident response team if they have a dedicated team or someone either, um, someone higher up than them a tech person or someone they know is related to cybersecurity if there's no current like incident response team. But the first thing a normal or non IR team member should do is contact them to see what to do next and then follow what they say. Because um, people on the incident response team have been trained in how to deal with certain incidents and what the best course of action is. A normal employee, um, like we pointed out earlier, might freak out and turn off a machine but during certain incidents, you really need that live data to see what happened and try to fix it. So instead of trying to unplug your computer or try to fix it yourself, unless you know exactly what's happening, then you should contact someone else who might know a bit more. Mm -hmm. And I also tell people too, to make sure you tell your employees that this isn't the time to go on Twitter and tell your 10,000 followers, hey, I'm at work and I think we're getting hacked right now. <laughs> That's not good, not good. No, no, we don't wanna be doing that. We have to keep our reputational uh, information in, in, at the top of mind too. So we don't wanna be doing anything like that. So, but if you don't tell them, they might do that. Well, I, I think it also, Dana, it's important to note. So a lot of organizations have a ticket system for IT problems. KTL is a Microsoft Gold partner and a CMMC registered provider organization. Their professional team members represent a variety of backgrounds and industries that will map out and guide you on your road to CMMC compliance. The process starts with a dedicated team of CMMC registered practitioners, understand your specific requirements, and are here to help every step of the way. KTL Solutions, 
delivering tailored solutions so you get the most out of your technology. Visit them today at ktlsolutions.com. And in the event of what you might believe, and maybe it's nothing, but if you believe you have an incident, the IT ticket system is not the way to go. You need, as Genesis alludes to, you need to contact somebody on the cybersecurity side. Um, and that typically is not, I mean, it, it is an IT person. I mean, we all do IT, but we're, we're not just IT, but you need to, and, and hopefully your organization has, has identified the differences and who to contact. Uh, and, and that's a part of the IRP, but hopefully that they've got that clearly defined. But yeah, don't submit a ticket because I, you know, I've seen that where people have submitted a ticket and then Melissa software has been tunneling through for three days until the IT team sees, oh my gosh. And then where does that leave you? And it's important too to make sure that they they know that phone number that it's written down somewhere because if you can't get into your computer system and that's where the contact information is for that person, especially if you're working in different buildings or people working from home or whatever, everybody should have that uh, that phone number. Yes, it should be posted on the wall. Like uh, instead of nine one one, call your incident response team. Yep, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Okay, you're just full of good ideas today here. Okay, so why are backups such a big deal? Okay, so backups are extremely important if you want to keep your files safe. Um, there are multiple um, different types of malware that directly affect your files. The most important or the most or the biggest one right now being ransomware. Um, a lot of people aren't exactly sure what it is, but the biggest way you can protect it against it is having backups. Because if you have a backup and a malware is like, ah, we've encrypted your files, you can't reach them. You'd be like, well, I just backed up my files. I can go back and not deal with this. So it's it can help you deal with uh, malware and other activities easier. Like if someone is, or even for like simple things, like if your computer, if a disk gets corrupted or something, if you don't have that data backed up, you have no way to get that data unless you want to use expensive um, disk imaging software or hire someone to recover that data from a corrupted disk. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you know, backups, we have, that's been a big thing for a long, long time since the eighties when the computers you know, came out and it was done before probably mainly for fire or if maybe mm -hmm. something or a flood or something where the computer was damaged or you know, something along those lines. But um, it's, it's a, obviously, as you're saying, it's a very important practice to, to get into. And also I tell people to take a look at what that backup looks like. Like if you, if you say, okay, great, we have a backup. Well, what does it look like? What is the format that the that data is in? And if you don't know, you know, is it just a big PDF with everything dumped together? Can you sort through it, you know, afterwards? And so that's a good well, question to ask. Yep. And I think it's important to note, so that is the another part of your security posture is in a lot of organizations. And, and I, I had a discussion before this call that, uh, I'm going to leave them out of that, um, is a disaster recovery plan. A lot of organizations, and that's the, the call I was on before I came here, is there's this huge government agency that has no disaster recovery plan. And in the event of an incident, whether it's ransomware or, or something a little less severe, uh, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan, which is a part of the backups, um, but it's, you know, it's the next step in, in having a solid security posture, if you don't have that, Again, you're missing some foundational pieces of, of your security program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but backing up or maintaining backups is also a very important part because you also want to make sure your backups aren't corrupted or they can be usable. So a good practice for a company to do is do backups and then go back through and make sure like on a weekly basis, at least to make sure those backups are usable. Yeah, so there's a lot of maintaining that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Trust, but verify. Yes. <laughs> so everyone's big question here that doesn't have one of these, how do you put one of these in place or how do you develop an incident response plan? Okay. The, well, the way I developed our incident response plan is by using a few frameworks. The main one I used is um, the NIST 800-61 um, special publication framework. That one outlines like the basic steps of incident response, as well as um, some digital forensic techniques that you need for it and how to handle evidence. That's a really good place to start for developing an incident response plan. Um, you can also look, there's tons of examples of good incident response plans. You could find one 
relative to what your company does. So we deal with a lot of healthcare. So I was looking at more um, incident response plans done by healthcare because we have different um, needs than say a college or university. Um, there's different um, what is it? compliance that needs to be upheld with certain incident response dealing with, for example, we deal with HIPAA during some of our phases, we need to inform people, hey, your um, information could be at risk. That is a legal requirement by HIPAA. And if it's not upheld, you could have tons of fines or tons of backlash. It just depends on which company you are. This includes stuff for like Sarbanes or socks. If you're dealing with credit cards, um, information, you need to first look at the publication and then find out what compliances you also need to keep in mind. So just make sure that through your incident response, you're keeping up with who you have to inform legally on that, uh, say a breach or incident has happened. A very good point. Very good point. Cause you're right. Great point. Compliances for different things and different people need to know what's going on. <laughs> All right. Well, this was great, great stuff. So is there anything else anybody wants to throw out there to help everybody about this topic? Well, the best thing you can do is just search up. There's the um, internet exists for a reason. There's plenty of resources. Um, NIST has a lot of uh, additional publications on digital forensics and incident response. Um, and there's plenty of example ones out there as well. There's also templates if you're interested in using those, but I would edit those to your organization's specifications. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, and I, and I, I think it's important what, what Genesis hit on right before we talk about that is the compliance requirements. And then, you know, NIST is a good framework to, to utilize if your company is, your organization is only working within the U.S. Uh, because there's ISO and, and within Europe there's GDPR. All have some very defined, uh, you know, or, or very, the, all three frameworks define the incident response plan, you know, but the bigger issue that really drives that is the compliance mm -hmm. issues. Um, you know, we've worked with a client that was international and the incident response plan we developed for them was, was much more complex and, uh, uh, a lot different than what we would use inside the United States, mm -hmm. just yeah. because of the compliance requirements, which really should be your driving factor in everything that you're doing with regards to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, good point. Well, thank you to both of you for your time and your information. This was very, very helpful. Hopefully our viewers and listeners are gaining some little tips to help them put one of these together. So thank you for that. And thank you everybody for listening. And we hope to see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. This episode is brought to you by Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies meet cybersecurity compliance requirements and prepare for CMMC. Their experienced team of engineers and consultants assist organizations of all sizes to implement and manage IT systems that meet the technical requirements in DFARS and CMMC.